We're standing today at the very headwaters of the Jordan River at the foot of Mount Hermon. In this fertile land, an enormous ancient city has been uncovered that dates back to at least 2000 BC. During the time of the judges, the Danite tribe captured this city and renamed it Dan, immediately setting up their own false gods. During the time of the kings, Jeroboam son of Nebat set up his own false gods in this place. As we examine this sad history, let's also examine our own faithfulness to the one true God. This ancient city was originally called Laish, also called Leshem. Situated at the head of a well-watered valley, it also lay on a major trade route from Damascus to the ports of the Mediterranean. Well, when we consider the overall importance of the site of Dan, there are really three things that come to mind for me. Number one, uh, its location, located in the northern section of modern-day Israel and Bible times to refer to the extent of the land that the Israelites owned, it would use the phrase from Dan to Beersheba. But then second, this place is important because of the archaeological discoveries that have been made there over the years. What archaeologists have unearthed really helps us to have a better understanding of life during the time of Abraham and after that and provide some archaeological evidence for uh, the verity, the truthfulness of the Bible. But then number three, Dan is very important because of what was discovered there and what was practiced there over the years in terms of its idolatry. In 1979, a discovery was made that astounded scholars the world over. Excavators uncovered an entrance gate of mud brick walls that stood 20 feet high and was almost completely intact. Even more amazingly, this gate was formed in the shape of an arch. The gateway dated to somewhere between 1700, but probably closer to 2000 BC. Until this discovery, historians believe that Romans invented the arch sometime around 500 BC. This gateway proved that arches were built in the Near East 1500 years earlier, at least. Even in 2015, this gate is the oldest intact archway in the world. Because Genesis 14:14 14, 14 records that Abraham visited this area, he may have actually walked these steps and passed underneath this arch. Abraham visited the city of Dan when it was known as Laish, and it was a city with impressive defenses. It was protected by a rampart wall that was over 25 feet thick at its core. Now, later on, when the Israelites are preparing to enter the Promised Land, we note that they are unable to establish complete control of all the territory allotted to them. This is especially true for the tribe of Dan. In Judges 18, we read that the Danites are in search of a place to call home. And so they send five men out to reconnoiter the land, and it's there that they notice the city of Laish. They see that it's prosperous, and the text states that they notice that the inhabitants live in security. This almost certainly is a reference to the formidable defenses that the city possessed. After conquering the city, the Danites renamed the city Dan. The Israelites built new walls and a huge new entrance with a series of massive gates. Leading up to the gate was an enormous paved plaza. The plaza leads to an outer gate and then an inner gate both with large towers and recessed chambers. When unearthed, the inner gate still contained a doorstop and hinge sockets from which gigantic wooden doors once swung. Between the two gates, in a middle paved plaza, researchers found a small raised platform. Some believe the platform provided a place for a ruler or judge to speak. 
The platform was flanked by small stone pots decorated with flower carvings. The pots had circular hollows in the top, probably for holding the poles to which a canopy would be attached. Near the platform was a stone bench along the wall, likely a seat of honor for elders. Judges 18 records that when the Danites came and conquered this city, they stopped in Ephraim and stole household gods from a man named Micah. They also took his own false priest to bring here to be a priest of their own false worship. Not surprisingly, the archeological remains here at Dan testify to rampant idolatry. Beside this small speaking platform is a stone turned onto its end and planted firmly in place. This stone was almost certainly a sacred stone or some symbol for pagan worship. Several other sacred stones associated with pagan worship were set up near the gate complex. When the Israelites came into the land of Canaan, they were instructed to reject and to remove idolatrous practices and influences, but they didn't always do so. The book of Judges says that these foreign religions were a snare to the people of God. As a result, it changed how they viewed themselves and how they related to God. They might maintain some of the right names and some of the practices associated with the law of Moses, but they also blended in these foreign elements, and as a result, their religion became ruined. This syncretism or blending was usually observable in the practice of idolatry, often using stone or other natural elements. The stones especially could be shaped or fashioned as desired, and because of their durability, they could be used for generations. Israelite children would grow up believing that these stones represented deities, or perhaps even Yahweh himself. Too often, this was the common experience for the Israelites. About 60 feet outside the outer gate in the large stone pavement was a set of five standing stones. More than likely, this was a place for visitors and residents to burn incense or offer some small token to a pagan god as they entered or exited the city. Pagan worship sites like these are what King Josiah destroyed as recorded in 2 Kings chapter 23. These small stones and altars pale in comparison to another worship place unearthed here at Dan. After the death of Solomon, the northern ten tribes of Israel rebelled against his heir Rehoboam making Jeroboam son of Nebat their king. Immediately, to prevent his citizens from returning to Jerusalem to worship the one true God, Jeroboam set up high places or places for idolatrous worship, one at Bethel in the south and this one at Dan in the north. The remains here at Dan testify to the magnitude of this idolatrous worship. Jeroboam's high place had two main aspects that cover more than a half an acre of land. One was a large raised platform, or bema, with a set of wide steps leading up to it. The platform measured 60 by 62 feet and was built out of expertly shaped stone. The golden calf almost certainly sat on top of this platform, remaining higher than all those who came to bow before it. Directly in front of the steps to the raised platform stood a huge horned altar. The altar stood about 10 feet high. A metal frame has been erected to give modern visitors an idea of the altar's dimensions. When unearthed, this area was littered with the bones of sheep, antelope, and other animals. The burning animals on this altar would have dominated the entire area and seemed to be overseen by the golden calf. To the side of the altar, Jeroboam and those who followed built a large number of stone buildings for the priests that Jeroboam appointed to minister before the false god. Many smaller altars, figurine idols, and worship utensils like shovels have been unearthed here. Predictably, the idolatry at Dan brought swift destruction on its inhabitants. In 1993, researchers here at Dan uncovered a stela or engraved stone with an earth-shaking inscription. The stela commemorated a victory by the king of Aram 
over both the king of Israel and king of Judah. This discovery made national headlines because the inscription mentions the name of David. It was commemorating the victory of an Aramean king named Hazael over two other kings. The first of these is identified as Jehoram, uh, king of Israel. The other is Ahaziah, who is identified as king of the house of David. Now this is a clear reference to the southern kingdom, and it was phrased this way because David was the founder of the ruling dynasty at that time. Now we have numerous examples of this in the ancient Near East. In Assyrian inscriptions, we have about a dozen references to the northern kingdom as the house of Amri. And it's labeled that way because he was the founder of the Amri dynasty. So when the Tel Dan inscription refers to the southern kingdom as the house of David, it does so with the recognition that David was indeed a historical figure. Until this stela was found, the biblical account of David and his dynasty was under brutal assault by skeptics. The discovery proved David was the head of a royal dynasty beginning no later than 900 BC. Further, it verified the biblical account of the divided kingdom that followed Solomon. In spite of withering attack, archaeology once again verified the exact accuracy of the biblical record. In 1 Kings 12, 28, Jeroboam said, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Jeroboam appealed to their laziness and their desire to have an easier way. But Jesus said to the woman at the well in John 4, 23 and 24, Behold, a time is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. We may define idolatry typically as bowing down before a stone or a statue. But Paul goes further and defines idolatry as any human desire that rises to the point of becoming the center of our lives rather than making God the center. Colossians chapter 3, for example, says that covetousness or greed is idolatry. In the 21st century, there are parts of the world where people still bow down before idols and statuary. But I wonder if this second form is not the more rampant and the more insidious as people seek after stuff. Idolatry lowers the human experience. It lowers people because all of these things are just things. Whenever people turn away from the God of the Bible and turn to these types of idols, they not only suffer spiritual decline, but they also suffer social decline, as the story from Dan and also the account of Romans chapter 1 indicates. Today, many people want to worship God on their own terms, or they want to have God conform to their ideas or their needs. True worship follows God's agenda and comes to God on His terms, recognizing His preeminence as the only true God. Worshiping false gods or worshiping God differently than how He prescribes always brings destruction and unhappiness. The false worship instituted by Jeroboam became the standard by which all the following kings the northern tribes would be measured. No fewer than 20 times the Word of God condemns the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat and how he led Israel into sin. 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 21 to 23, teaches us that these sins brought judgment when God removed Israel from his sight because of their disobedience, their idolatry, and their lack of faith. Over time, the tribe of Dan completely lost its identity as a tribe of God's people. The genealogies in 1 Chronicles chapters 2 through 12 contain no genealogy for the tribe of Dan. Even more sadly, Dan is omitted from the list of the 144,000 who were sealed in Revelation 7 verses 5 through 8. People today may not bow down to idols of stone or wood, but we worship at the altar of money, making sacrifices to the false gods of fashion and physical beauty. We pay homage to sports teams 
and magnify the names of performers. This type of idolatry, no less than the idolatry of Dan, will also lead to misery and destruction. You are the heavens and I am a star You are the thunder and I am a whisper Quietly longing to be where you are When I walked through Tell Dan, I was simply amazed by a number of things. One, its beauty. All around this ancient tell is some beautiful flora and fauna that is fed by a beautiful spring that comes out at the base of Mount Hermon. It's a very tropical environment, an environment that really a lot of people don't think of when they envision the Bible lands. But not only was Tel Dan remarkable to me because of its beauty, but I was impressed because of the archaeology that has unearthed a number of things there over the years that really help prove and demonstrate the Bible's verity, its truthfulness, to help us to realize that when Abraham, who sojourned through the Bible lands and later on came here and rescued his nephew Lot, that these are real places that you can actually go and visit them, just as the Bible describes. But then number three, in contrast to the beauty of this place, really it was a grotesque place to me in a lot of ways because of the idolatry that was practiced there, because of the sin that was committed there. When I first went to Dan, I was shocked by how lush the vegetation was. It was almost like walking through a rainforest at times, with the rain and the, the rich growth of flowers and trees and, and grasses. But I was horrified, I was almost heartbroken by the ancient idolatry that you can still see there. And it seems silly, it seems so foolish, that people would put their faith in these rocks, in these simple carvings. But then you realize that they lost their faith, they lost their lives, they lost their place in Israel because of this foolishness, because of this idolatry.